What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. All right, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I am joined by a true legend in the business, Rick Rule, the CEO of Sprott US Holdings. Rick, how are you? Life is good, almost embarrassingly good, given the trials and tribulations that other people around the world seem to be going through. My my wife will tell you I was born for lockdown, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I can kind of relate to that. I really enjoy not having to leave my house. Um, okay, I have a challenge for you. In 30 minutes or less, you need to make me a better investor. Do you think you're up for it? Yeah, I do. I do. All right, Absolutely. awesome. You're, you're a curious young man. You'll make a good investor without my help, but I'd love to take credit for speeding you along. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, you know, I thought it'd be uh, just kind of fun to open this one up with a quote that I heard you say on my podium about 18 months ago at a show in Vancouver. And I think you were essentially summarizing the sentiment of retail investors over the previous seven year bear market. And it went something like this, please, Lord, give me one more bull market and I promise I will not waste this one. So it might be staring us in the face now. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think it certainly is staring us in the face. Uh, I, uh, you know, it was pretty obvious to me at that point in time that things were turning. Uh, cash was coming back into the sector. We were coming off oversold bottoms. So irrespective of whether or not we were going to launch into a full-blown bull market, anybody who paid attention was going to make money. Uh, and it's important that you not be a spreadsheet millionaire. That is to say, it's important not to add up your winnings and not take them. Mm. <laughs> it's important if you've uh, endured the pain of a bear market to enjoy the gain of a bull market, but enjoy it very fully, which is to say, come out of it with something. It's important too in natural resources to understand that bear markets are the cause of bull markets and bull markets are the cause of bear markets. And when you're doing very, very well, doing well is seductive and you tend to overstay your welcome. So that'll be a lovely topic for today. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm very keen to jump into that, the how to sell, right? Because we always talk about uh, what to buy, when to buy, how to buy. Rarely ever talk about how to sell, which in my experience is the harder part of the trade. And as I said before we hit record, that's, that's where I lose sleep at night is how to get out of positions, when to get out of positions, did I get out too early, all the what's, what's, what's in your brain. So I want to get to that. But prior to, let's address this. Uh, we are moving into, let's say, the next resource bull market. And, and as you know, and I know, uh, as the market heats up, so is all of the noise and the pollution in our news feeds and our deal flow. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it becomes more treacherous for retail investors. And, you know, sure, the upside could be greater, but there's lots more landmines out there. And so what can you tell retail investors, new or not to the sector, what they should be watching out for in the coming, you know, 12, 18 months if things continue to heat up? Well, we're already seeing it. Uh, we saw uh, an absolute explosion of interest and money available to the junior sector uh, beginning in June of 2020. There were any number of companies that had a choice between filing an offering, offering memorandum or filing bankruptcy. They chose the offering memorandum, raised more money than they could possibly dream of. <laughs> uh, you know, we've already seen the first blow off the first of several uh, in this bull market. And we've seen uh, the first real incidences of excess in the market. I myself had never seen a bull market that went directly from the best of the best, which is to say the Franco Nevadas, the barracks of the world, all the way to the penny dreadfuls uh, without missing a beat. You didn't see the middle of the market move. What you saw is the best of the best move and then you saw the penny dreadfuls move. So we've already seen the beginnings of the excesses. Uh, every bull market is the same uh, and every bull market is different. This one is different because precisely uh, of what you do, social media. I'm not saying you particularly, but I'm saying your venue. Um, the really good news about that is that information isn't distributed any longer in a top-down fashion. Investors don't don't wait to be uh, force fed research reports, if that's what they are, from investment banks, mm -hmm. which tell you a lot about what the bank is long and not very much about the companies that they purport to cover. Rather, information is increasingly peer to peer, which is fantastic. 
The other thing that's fantastic is that the amount of information, real information available online at Edgar, at Cedar, at places like that, the amount of information that investors have at their hands to make intelligent decisions is huge. There is so much information, however, that many feel, people feel daunted by it, and, and they don't avail themselves of either knowledgeable peers or uh, of the company's legal filing statements, which is to say there's so much information around that's, that, that at times there's a surplus of information. And people new to the sector in particular are more narrative oriented than they are fact oriented. Mm, absolutely. Which makes them absolute suckers for the online promotional factories, which are proliferating from everywhere. Right. Now, this will sort itself out. Every generation of investors, you're going to have to par pardon my jocular financial phrase, but every generation of investors has to get their ass kicked. Uh, happened to me in the decade of the 70s. I've told you before, I went from being broke to being an extra extraordinarily wealthy young man to being broke again. Uh, I round tripped it. Hmm. Uh, something I hope, and I hope doesn't happen to most of your readers. But the, the truth is that this will follow predictable patterns and people will make some fairly predictable mistakes. Not all will, not all need to. And I'm delighted to have this discussion to help people avoid some of the worst of them. Okay. Now, there's some interesting points in there, specifically about, I guess, newer investors uh, appealing to the narrative approach, right? The storytelling approach, which you're right. right. It's like, it's far easier to, to use that strategy online. The tough part is that even the best CEOs in the business recognize that and they do it very well. Take a Robert Friedland, for example. He's an amazing salesman but he backs up that story by hitting milestones and delivering value for his shareholders. And I think you'll find that Ross Beatty tells a great story. So how do you differentiate then Rick between, you know, the, the, the CEO with credibility and, and share Ross and, and Robert are easy, but go down, go down a tier to the newer individuals. Well, let's start by saying that it's okay not to catch every story, which means it's okay not to follow every CEO and every leader. It's okay if you aren't in a future superstar's first deal. It's okay to miss his or her first deal. You start off in any speculative business by understanding that the people are in the near term at least more important than the assets. And so find a team, old or young, that has an established track record already. Mm. And there's plenty of them. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to look for old fat bald guys like me. Uh, there are plenty of people in their 30s and 40s and 50s uh, in every major mining center in the world who have already established a track record of success. Uh, and then examine obvious flaws in the narrative. E even back in the days when your father ran Cambridge House, People would ask me at your Vancouver conference, Rick, if the price of gold goes to, you know, pick a number, goes up, what would that, what would that do to the affairs of uh, amalgamated moose pasture mines? And I would have to say, well, amalgamated moose pasture is looking for gold. They don't have any gold. Mm. And if the price of something that you don't have any of goes up, why should it matter? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, an awful lot of avoiding pitfalls is simple common sense, which seems to be lacking. If a small exploration company is headed by, uh, parenthetically, a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker, uh, but it's missing geologists or engineers, or if the geologists, while experienced, don't have any experience in that terrain or looking for that deposit type, the probability of their succeeding is extremely low, ir irrespective of the gold narrative mm. uh, and irrespective probably of the uh, blandishments offered up by the broker who's trying to sell it to you. Right, right. Yeah, I'm with you. And that's, that's like my core ambition in this sector is to find those individuals who have one or two wins. Uh, you pay a bit more, right, to, to enter the deal than you do for somebody who's fresh out the gate but you don't pay as much as a Ross Beatty or a Freeland. There's that sweet spot. And I, I call out CEOs like Ivan Bebek. I mean, I've called him on the show before. I'm pretty bullish on Ivan and, and a shareholder in his deals, but he's got Keegan resources, Caden resources, delivered in bad markets. Now he's got a tailwind. Now I'm really curious what he's going to do with it. 
Um, okay, so moving on then, Rick, if, uh, if we do well in the spec market, what I wanted to get your thoughts on is how you cycle your profits, meaning that at a super high level, the way I organize my portfolio is I have assets and investments and speculations and fingers crossed things go well, I generate cash in the speculative market, I take those profits out and reallocate them, reallocate them to my assets or my investments. How do you work that system? How, talk, talk to me how your portfolio works together like that. Well, let's back it up. We sure. began by saying that bear markets are the authors of bull markets. The right time to start speculating in a sector is when nobody else is in it. Now, we're a little late in the precious metals, probably two years too late for that. But it's important to know, particularly for somebody of your age, that you're going to have another opportunity to buy things cheap. <laughs> you may resent it because you may have left some money on the table. We'll talk about that later. But you're going to have another chance to buy these things cheap. When extractive capital intensive sectors move, the biggest and the best move first. So if you are anticipating a, a move in a commodity price, which hasn't occurred yet, if that commodity is hated, which is the right time to buy it, you begin by investing, not speculating. You buy the biggest and the best in the sector. When interest returns to the sector, the best of the best move first. And importantly, even though you're early, the best of the best you usually pay fairly handsome dividends. So the time value of money uh, goes away. Normally, uh, bull markets follow fairly predictive patterns. The biggest, the best of the best, the best of the rest. Then the single asset producers, you, you know, it sort of cascades down the quality trail. That didn't, that didn't happen this time. It went from the best of the best all the way down to the penny dreadfuls. Without why, do you think, why do you think that occurred, Rick? Any, any I have no idea, uh, honestly. <laughs> One of the joys of life is that it's completely unpredictable <laughs> with regards to that. Yeah. Uh, I just react to it. The... When beginning in June, there wasn't much to buy in the junior sectors, I began to do some selling. Uh, and I began to see value popping up in the large single asset producers that I thought needed to be taken over. Okay. Uh, and some of the second tier multi-asset producers that were generating rather spectacular amounts of free cash flow, which is to say that although we were in a bull market, there were certain sectors in the market that weren't uh, never mind, they weren't overpriced. They were actually, in historical terms, cheap. And I tried to uh, cycle my money there. R returning to your original question, I think it's important uh, in terms of building uh, wealth in cyclical sectors that you remember not to overstay your welcome. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in truth, Jay, I've always been early, both on the buy side and on the sell side. When I tell famous stories about things like Paladin, which went from 10 cents to $10, or Arequipa, which went from 30 cents to $30, uh, what I sometimes neglect to tell people is that I sold all the way up. The idea that I bought all of my Paladin at 10 cents and sold all of my Paladin at $10, while it's an interesting fantasy, is in fact a fantasy. Yeah. Bernard Baruch famously said the only guy who absolutely bought at the bottom and sold at the top was a liar. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you take you take your swack out of the middle. So that's what you need to do. Remembering too that uh, making money really involves understanding the delta between price and value. Most speculators pay slavish attention to price because it's quoted. They can get it in the computer. It's easy to obtain. And it feels to them like something they can spend, although they don't sell. But price is of no importance if you don't have a sense of value. If something is selling for a dollar and you think it is logically or is about to be worth two dollars, that's a reasonable speculation. If something is worth a dollar and you have if something, pardon me, is selling for a dollar and you have no idea what it's worth, why should its price matter to you? Most people forget that very simple fundamental. Right. Well, and you can't really blame them when you look at the broad market and the valuations of some of the biggest companies listed and how these valuations aren't aren't tied to uh, tangible or calculatable value. And if you apply that same psychology to the junior money market, then, it, you know, I, I can see why that happens. One of the lovely things when you come to be my age, if there is anything lovely about that, is that you come to understand that there's no particular need to do things that you don't understand. 
So for me personally, trying to value Amazon uh, was an exercise that I knew I could never master. At least I couldn't outcompete two or 300 other people. Uh, and so I decided to set it out. The fact that I uh, sat out uh, a company that probably had a hundred fold move is interesting to me, but not particularly relevant because I did fine doing what I do. <laughs> and I slept nights and stayed calm. Uh, it is important, as you suggest, to remember to sell. And the most important part of remembering to sell has to do with the relationship between price and value. Every time I buy a stock, every single time, I write down why. Uh, I, I write down what could go right, what could go wrong, what my price expectations might be if things went right, if they went, what their my price expectations would be if they go wrong. What would cause me to declare victory and walk away? What would cause me to declare defeat and walk away? And I'm one of the few investors I know who does that. It seems in speculative circumstances that the prevailing ethos has got a hunch, but a bunch, uh, which is, I mean, this sounds fairly arrogant, but it's why I end up with the money. <laughs> sure. Let's say, for example, that the aforementioned amalgamated moose pasture, uh, let's say this thing has a, some exploration tap tract in northern Ontario or northern Quebec that, you know, uh, it is within goggle range of a head frame. People are excited about it, all that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, and, and let's say it's selling for a buck a share. Sure. And that seems like a fair valuation. So people buy it and you're in a bull market. Uh, and you buy it because they're going to drill some target that might validate a surface expression or something like that. Let's say the price goes from a dollar to two dollars on no news. Mm. Now you're elated. Uh, your decision making process has been validated. The stock went up, all these wonderful things. It's a hell of a company. It's also arithmetically precisely half as attractive. If the price of something doubles and nothing has changed with regards to the value, it is precisely half as attractive. One of the disciplines that I have stuck to for about 35 years is that I understand that uh, speculation of all kinds, but exploration speculation in particular, is really a game of answering unanswered questions uh, and trying to understand the implications of a market's more fully understanding the nature of an opportunity or a deposit. Okay. And whenever I buy an exploration company, I ask the management team to describe for me the principle and answer question. What is it that you can determine that will increase the market's knowledge of your property? What do you think the probabilities of success are? How much money will it take? How long will it take? In other words, what's your business plan? Over the years, probably 80% of the time I've answered that question, the management teams have said to me, oh, that's an interesting question. I never thought of it that way, which is actually doing me a favor because I can throw that company away and not revisit them. I don't have to waste any more time on that particular company. It's as though in Vancouver parlance, somebody was prepared to walk from Vancouver to Whistler, you know, got all the right boots, all that kind of stuff, and then headed east towards Hope. Right. Um, <laughs> it might work. Yeah. but it's likely not to work. So if you have planned what you're going to do, nothing is ever going to work out to plan, but you'll have a framework which will allow you to understand if you should buy stock, hold stock, or sell stock. If, as an example, um, the aforementioned amalgamated moose pasture, let's say I think that there's a, I don't know, 25% chance that uh, their drill program uh, will enjoy initial success and that they will prove that the deposit extends to depth in the same sort of strata geology that they had anticipated. And that answering that means that they have a legitimate target defined in a third dimension with a drill hole. And this dollar stock should go to three, three and a half dollars. And let's say just for fun, that happens. They drill a hole <laughs> and uh, it, it, their success is validated and the stock goes up. You don't necessarily sell if your target has been met. What you do is you repeat the process. 
with the information available to me now, what's the next unanswered question? What's the time frame? How long does it take to get a yes answer? Mm -hmm. By contrast, if amalgamated moose pasture drills the hole and they miss it, and the stock goes down from a dollar to 70 cents, when my reason to own a stock goes away, the stock goes away. Yeah. I would much rather lose 30 cents than lose 70 or 80 cents. It's important that people abandon hope. Hope is not an investment strategy. If the reason to own a stock goes away, the stock must go away irrespective of the price. Don't find yourself a new question to ask yeah. to justify an existing mistake. That, that is such good advice. And it's it sounds so silly and simple when you say hope is not an investment strategy. But I think we've all been caught in that. Well, I can relate to it where you know you buy something, the price goes down, you still have confidence, but news has changed and you're kind of wondering if speculation is going to pick it back up again for you, right? And you can sit on that all the way to zero. And the opposite is true too. Uh, I've learned very well from a couple of people in our firm, uh, Dr. Neil Adshed, who's like you from Vancouver, Steve Toderick, who works for us in San Diego, both great geologists. Uh, I, I've learned that sometimes after a successful drill hole, uh, a stock is cheaper at $3 than it was at a dollar because you have information available to establish value. Mm. Uh, it's just important that your uh, speculation be rationally based, empirically based, uh, and information based. It's important too, Jay, in order to do that, that you don't own too many stocks. Right. right. You may know that I, uh, for free, evaluate people's portfolios for them. Uh, and I've evaluated about 20,000 portfolios in the last 12 months. Wow. And one of the things that I've learned is that many people own many, many, many too many stocks. It's important. It's impossible for them if they have any lives whatsoever to monitor as many stocks as they have. Uh, it's impossible for them to make the connection between price and value. It's impossible for them to keep up on the news. It's impossible for them even to monitor insider filings in that many stocks. It's just, it's an impossibility. Uh, I would argue that most of your listeners would be well advised to have the number of speculative stocks in their portfolio correspond to the numbers of number of hours per month that they're willing to spend working on their portfolio. Right. Willing to spend 10 hours a month, focus on 10 stocks. Willing to spend 15 hours a month, 15 stocks. Sure. Not willing to work, don't own stocks. Right. Yeah, can't with you. Well, that may lead to, to another question I had for you. Um, why should investors who are entering the sector on the back of a discount trading brokerage like Robinhood, E-Trade, Q-Trade, et cetera, consider a broker in the junior mining business, Rick? Well, the easiest way is how much, how much work you're willing to put into it. Yeah. Uh, if you believe that information is worth something, then you need to know that you have to pay for the information. Uh, if something is free, if anything is free, if any product is free, what you need to understand is that you are the product. Sure. So as an example, if you're going to Robinhood, they sell your order flow to a market maker. Uh, their, adver their, their investment advice is worse what they charge for it, which is to say nothing. If right. you believe that you are adequately versed in exploration, if you believe that you have sufficient geological knowledge, sufficient financial knowledge, and are prepared yourself to monitor those aspects of your speculation, you don't need any assistance from a broker. If you don't believe that, then perhaps you do need assistance with a broker. It's interesting to watch uh, good shoppers, generally female, uh, in a grocery store, reading labels, comparing cost per ounce, doing all the things that rational consumers would do, and juxtaposing that with the way stocks, the way people buy stocks, right. uh, which are often bigger ticket items, the idea that somebody would spend substantially more time and attention uh, buying a two dollar can of tuna fish than they did placing a ten thousand dollar stock order has always bewildered me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a fact of life. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, okay, okay. Um I want to wrap it up with some forecast, Rick. 2021, what commodities? Maybe try to pick two for me. Two commodities, most bullish on. 
going to be a good year. Um, precious metals, the wind is in your sails. That isn't to say it's not going to be volatile. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have sell-offs. Uh, but the wind is in your sails. Governments around the world are debasing currencies. Quantitative easing, if it was done by Jay Martin, would be an indictable offense. You'd be in jail. Uh, but if you were a member of parliament, it would be highly popular and would get you reelected. No doubt it debases the currency. Debt and deficits, debasing the currency, wrecking the savers of people in conventional instruments. Negative real interest rates, debasing the currency. Zero doubt in my mind that people need to own precious metals and precious metals equities. Good ones uh, and speculative ones if they're willing to do the work. I, for a flyer commodity, uh, although it has performed a little too well in the last two months for my liking, would be uranium. You need to buy things that are cheap, and uranium is cheap, that are hated, and uranium is hated, that's why it's cheap, but are already in an uptrend, uptrend uh, which uranium is already in an uptrend. So from a sort of a speculative flyer point of view, I like the uranium trade. What could go wrong? Well, there's too few uranium stocks for one thing. Right. It's not even an asset class anymore. Uh, a faltering economy could limit demand for electricity and hence slow the pace of reactor construction and restarts around the world. Or you could have a repeat of Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and set, set the industry back. Right. But a uranium bull market is uh, a, a truly rare event. Uh, and there are so many people around who remember the last one. And the arithmetic, not the narrative, but the arithmetic around uranium is so compelling that I think if you want a flyer story, you ask me for two, uh, I would go to uranium. Mm -hmm. My favorite commodity, mineral commodity, has probably always been copper. Hey, okay. But the copper market is, from my point of view, I, I, I've been wrong for a year, mercifully. <laughs> Way, way, way ahead of itself. Uh, and one last commodity. You asked me for two. I'll give you four. Sure. Canadian oil and gas. Interesting. Way oversold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice dividend yields. Yeah, Canada yeah. has spectacular natural resources and also has spectacular human resources in the oil and gas business. Okay. The only thing wrong with the oil and gas business in Canada is Ottawa. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that gets any better. Uh, but if you want to find a, a commodity that is cheap uh, and unloved, but in a rebound, it's oil and gas. And in this continent, at least, the most unloved oil and gas in the continent is in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's, that's excellent. Um, Rick, thanks so much. This has been super valuable. You know what? I got one more minute here. I want to just clarify one thing if I can. I've heard you because I've heard you say this a few times. There's there's a uranium bull market is something special, right? I've heard you frame this differently than I've heard you talk about other precious metals and, and the sentiment surrounding them. And I can say from experience, whenever, whenever we build a uranium feature at, at a show or, or online, the audience is ferocious. I mean, it's amazing how enthusiastic, even in a depressed market, seven, eight years in, it's still always a packed room. It's an incredibly loyal uh, following, it seems. So what what is it about uranium when you say, okay, they're, they are super rare. Yes, it's been very depressed. But what, what strikes you about uranium specifically? Well, for a small part of the market, that the part of the market that's rational and logical, the arithmetic is so compelling. Uh, uranium supplies 15% of America's electric, electrical demand, 20% of the baseload demand. Mm -hmm. If the uranium price stays too low for too long in the United States, the lights go out. Uh, it takes about $50 a pound, fully loaded, not cash cost, but fully loaded to make a pound of uranium, and they sell it for $30, yeah. losing $20 a pound and trying to make it up on volume. If the price of uranium doesn't increase to the incentive price in five or six years, the lights go out in the United States or Canada. What do you think is more likely? The lights go out or the price go up? Right, right. And that one's fairly simple. The second thing is that the experience that people enjoyed, that some of us enjoyed, 
in the last bull market was so extraordinary uh, if we got in early that you have a class of old, fat, rich investors like myself who would like to, uh, to experience that one more time before they die. Right. Uh, the taste of a market. And let me put this into perspective for you. There were five uranium juniors at the beginning of the last bull market. The poorest performer in my memory over six years, the poorest performer went 22 to one. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> okay. So when you ask why, first of all, it's a compelling story. And second of all, there's an institutional memory. Yeah. Uh, of what can happen if you are on time and right in the sector. It's a very potent combination. It's at once a reality and an extraordinary dream. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, you mentioned you are willing to rank investors' portfolios. I strongly encourage people to do this. Essentially, you send your top 10, correct? T top 10 stock picks? Any number. Any number. No, Any number. Yeah. He'll get back well, to you. With, uh, he'll rank them. Yeah, let me make the offer specifically. Go to a website, sproutusa.com forward slash rankings. You'll find a drop down form. Uh, enter your uh, portfolio there. Names and symbols, please. I'm too old to know all the symbols. <laughs> I will rank them personally, one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment on individual issues where I think my comments might have value. Please, no pot stocks, no psilocybin stocks. No banks, just stuff I have a hope of understanding. In addition, if you include charts in the subject line of your request, uh, I will send back the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the longest running, most inclusive gold equities index on the planet. Not because I'm an adherent necessarily to technical analysis, but because it's a wonderful visualization tool that talks about the duration and dimension of gold bull markets and also points out the volatility in gold bull markets, which gives speculators the intestinal fortitude to handle fairly common 15 or 20 percent sell offs. Right. And I'll also include a hundred year commodity chart, which will provide visual evidence of just how cheap industrial commodities are relative to other asset classes going back a hundred years. Once again, SprottUSA.com forward slash rankings. I'll rank your resource portfolio. If you want, I will send you these two charts, not as a technical tool, but rather as a visualization tool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. It's, it's silly not to participate in this. Uh, coming back to how much work is involved vetting these companies, trying to pick the winners. Why wouldn't you send your portfolio over to Rick and get his thoughts? I've done this and he fired back. I sent him 10 stocks. He fired back best to worst with comments beside each. Um, and he doesn't pull any punches. He told me most of them are too expensive to buy right now. So he's honest about it. Okay, Rick, I really appreciate your time. And it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Jay, it's my pleasure. And please give my regards to your entire family. I will. Appreciate that.